Marakkam, Namaskar, Good Morning, Sashriyakal. It's Saturday and we are here with our Dekho Apna Tej. And this is like season two because we have already completed 100 episodes in the first season. And this is season two and this is episode number three. And today we are going to have a special story about Buddhism. And sitting from Noida, starting with Chennai, we are going to Pan India. So without wasting our time, I'm uh, calling uh, Mrs. Akila Raman and Mrs. Lakshmi Shankar from Storytelling. So Akila ma'am, the stage is yours. Please go ahead. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Bukashi. So hello, welcome to this presentation. I'm so glad you're all joining us today because it's completely our pleasure. So like uh, Mutuji rightly said, I'm Akila. My colleague is Lakshmi. And we both are here to speak about a very interesting topic. So we are from an organization called Story Trails. And our job in Story Trails is basically to collect very interesting stories, uh, interesting little details and tidbits from various uh, places, you know, whether it's from a museum, whether it's from uh, a, a landmark in a city, uh, whether it's from um, any place, the local neighborhood, if you so please. And then we weave it together into stories and we present it through walking tours, through audio guides, through podcasts, through blogs, um, uh, uh, so many other things, videos, webinars. We've been doing quite a few webinars and we are very happy to tell you that this is the sixth of the webinars that we are doing for uh, the Ministry of Tourism and we are uh, immensely grateful to the Ministry of Tourism for giving us this opportunity. So today's uh, webinar is called the Buddhist Relics of Amaravati. Where is Amaravati? What is Amaravati? Lots of questions I'm sure buzzing around in your brains. So we'll tell you the answers to all that in due course. But what we're going to share with you is a set of stories about um, you know, they're all largely centered around this place, the Government Museum in Egmore, where you have a gallery called the Amaravati Gallery. And it is an incredible place because what is on display at the Amaravati Gallery is a set of stone sculptures, which are the oldest Buddhist artwork in the world, displayed in the second oldest museum in the world. Now, that is an exciting set of uh, records for us, isn't it? There you have some pictures of it. So. To make sense of these relics, to actually set a context to it, we'll be taking you through different parts of India. We'll be sharing stories about different personalities who had a hand in the development of Buddhism. We'll take you through different events that helped in the spread of Buddhism. And we will take you through some monuments that tell you the story of Buddhism also. So that is the premise for today's workshop. And like I said, Lakshmi and I are delighted to have you all with us. So, to start off, let's try and set one small context, right? So <clears throat> I'm going to take you back in time and to a different place. I'm taking you into the 18th century and into, uh, uh, to be very specific, I'm taking you to 1797, the exact date if you like. And I'm taking you to a place called Deepaladima. Deepaladima is in modern day Andhra Pradesh. And there, there was this Englishman, you can see his picture on your screen, Colin McKinsey. He was walking around the city when he came across a series of broken uh, ruins lying all around a vast area in Deepaladama. So he, he realized it was the ruins of a stupa. Now, so what exactly is a stupa? It is a Buddhist monument. And it has, it's generally characterized by that domed top that you can see in your picture. So, this was the stupa that, uh, so he saw the remains of the stupa lying all around. He didn't exactly, he couldn't exactly put his finger on what it was, but he did know that what he was seeing was important. He went away from there. He came back there in 1816, a good, almost 20 years later. And much to his horror, he realized the place had been vandalized. The locals had taken all those stones and reused it in building their houses, in lining their wells, and doing all kinds of things for themselves. But even with all that loss, there were many pieces, beautifully carved pieces lying all around. And Colin McKinsey 
realized that this was the time he had to do something about it. Now, it also helped that Colin McEntee by himself was a man who was greatly in love with Indian art and architecture, who liked Indian culture, wanted to know more about it. More importantly, he was the surveyor general of the Madras presidency. So you see, he had the resources, he had the means to be able to do something about it. So very cleverly, he documented everything that he saw. He packed some of the best pieces that he could lay his hands upon and sent it off to three museums across the world. A good bit of it went to London and big chunks of it went to Calcutta and to Madras. And what you can see even today in the Madras Museum is the Amaravati marbles that are still showcased over there. So that brings us to the question, why would these stones, which you can see in your picture lying all around, why, was they, why were they so important? What was its significance? Today, we know that these stones were carved a good 2000 years ago, and that they are some of the earliest examples of Buddhist art in the world. So what Colin McKenzie had actually stumbled upon were the remains of a stupa, of a, of a stupa in a place called Amaravati. And Amaravati was the capital city of the Satavahanas. That is their entire empire. And that was where they ruled. Which again brings us to another question. Who were these Satavahanas? We haven't heard much about them at all, isn't it, in our history? So these Satavahanas were a very important dynasty between uh, the second century BCE and the second century CE. So they ruled for about four centuries. During that period, their biggest chunk of trade happened with the Romans on the other side of the Arabian Ocean. So you can imagine they must have been extreme seafarers. They were also considered to be feudatories of the Mauryan Empire. And some historians believe that they broke free of the Mauryan Empire after the reign of Ashoka and declared themselves independent. So you can see their position bang there in the middle of central India. They ruled over vast territories and if you look at the map today, you'll instantly recognize what they ruled was today's uh, Maharashtra, Karnataka, and a big chunk of Andhra Pradesh. These were the areas that came under uh, their purview, but they had many capitals. In the course of their 400 years of history, their capital kept changing, and one of their capitals happened to be Amaravati. And it was in Amaravati that Colin Mackenzie discovered those ancient stones. So we'll be talking a lot about this dynasty in the course of today's uh, webinar. But before we go there, let's introduce one more character into our story, Emperor Ashoka. He figures very, very strongly in our uh, story of Buddhism because he was the one who literally gave the religion a shot in the arm, if I may use those words. So he did a lot for Buddhism, but how did the whole thing pan out? Lakshmi will tell you a little more about that. Sure. Thank you, Atila. Let me take you back in time. Over 2000 years ago, in the year 260 BCE, there was a fierce battle that raged on the plains of a place called Kalinga. Kalinga is part of modern day Odisha. And the battle that was fought at that time changed the course of religious history, not just in India, but in Sri Lanka, and then later in all parts of Southeast Asia. China, Korea, and Japan. It led to the spread of Buddhism all over India. And then later, it also took root in other parts of the world. You know, back then, Kalinga was a prosperous and independent state. Uh, just above Kalinga to its north lay the Mauryan dynasty, their kingdom, which was expanding aggressively. In fact, the Mauryan empire covered almost the entire subcontinent. The king of the Mauryas was Emperor Ashoka, and Ashoka wanted to annex Kalinga. Ashoka did win the battle, but at the cost of thousands of soldiers. It is said that as he walked the battlefield after the victory, Ashoka was horrified by what he saw. In just like that, he made a quick decision and he laid down his weapons. He decided to take it upon himself to spread Buddhism, a religion that preached uh, ahimsa or non-violence. It was still early days for Buddhism, but it had certainly gotten itself a powerful ambassador in Ashoka. So how did Ashoka go about spreading Buddhism? Well, Ashoka carved the, or inscribed the teachings of Buddha on pillars and uh, stone slabs. 
These were called the Ashokan edicts, and they were found scattered in large parts of India. You can see many of the edicts here on your screen. In fact, did you know that uh, these edicts were considered to be some of the oldest stone stru structural remains of ancient India? Ashoka also built stupas and shrines to spread Buddhism. Which brings me to the question, why did he build the stupas? Or rather, what are stupas? And why did Ashoka build them? What was the purpose the stupas were built for? Well, a clue lies in some of these objects that we find in the museums across India. This is one such object that we found at the Egmode Museum in the Amravati Gallery. Take a look at this picture. These are the stone caskets. Uh, can you guess what they were used for? Way back in the past, these stone caskets were used to store the cremated remains of Lord Buddha. Sounds incredible. Well, here's the story from Akila. Thank you, Lakshmi. It's strange, no? Such chipped, broken stone caskets, and yet they held something so very valuable. So how did this whole process happen? So to tell you this story, I'm going to take you to Sanchi, one of the oldest and the most prominent of the Buddhist monuments in India, the Sanchi Stupa in Madhya Pradesh. And here in Sanchi, on the stone panels that are found in the stupa itself, the story of what happened after Buddha's death is carved on those panels. And all this happened nearly 2,500 years ago. So how did the whole thing pan out? Well, it is believed that Buddha died somewhere around 483 BCE. And he died in a place called Kushinagara. The Kushinagara was in the kingdom of a, of a clan called the Mallas in North India. So immediately after his death, Buddha's remains, mortal remains were cremated, but the ashes, the bones, the nails, teeth, hair, certain parts of the body that was not cremated, they were all collected and they were safely preserved. Why? So that future generations could draw inspiration from these mortal remains. So the mallas collected them and kept those things safe. But at that time, the Mallas were not the only ones who venerated Buddha. There were seven other kingdoms also who thought that the Buddha was the great, the enlightened one. So they too wanted a share of his relics. And what happened was a war broke out between these eight kingdoms over the remains of Buddha. Finally, they reached a compromise. And they said, we'll share these remains into eight uh, caskets. So they took eight caskets, like the ones you saw in your picture, and they put a few of the remains into each one of those eight. And each of the eight kingdoms took it to their own capital. They buried it under the ground and they built a beautiful stupa on top of it. Now, many, many years later, I'm talking about 2,300 years later, somewhere in 1818, there was another English general. Now, this is not Colin McKinley, but there's another English general who was on patrol. He was walking through the hilly jungles of central India. What was he looking for in those jungles? Basically, he was on the hunt for some bandits who were hiding over there. So he was hunting for those bandits, but what he really stumbled upon were the remains of a 2,000-year-old monument. He found the remains of the Sanchi Stupa. So it is there today we know it is a very important Buddhist shrine, one of the oldest uh, Buddhist monuments, stone monuments in India. And it is this Sanchi Stupa that actually gave historians a very good insight into all those events that followed after Buddha's death. We wouldn't have known it if not for what the Stupa had to tell us. Now, as luck would have it, in the 1830s, a little after uh, this Stupa itself was discovered, there was another English man who managed to decipher a very ancient script in India called the Brahmi script. So it was in use, but it was a long forgotten script by the, by the 1830s. So it was found on 2000 year old pillars scattered all across the Indian subcontinent. And now, because the uh, script was deciphered, because the code was broken, every historian could read what those uh, pillars said. And that's how was introduced to its greatest Buddhist king. 
Emperor Ashoka. That's how he comes into our picture over here. So we know that Ashoka was crowned king in 268 BCE. That's about 200 years after Buddha died. Like Lakshmi just said, he conquered large parts of the continent of the subcontinent. He converted to Buddhism. He started spreading Buddhism with great zeal. But unfortunately, at that time, he found that many of these old Buddhist shrines and stupas, they were already 200 years old by then, isn't it? So they all started crumbling. They were all falling to pieces. And uh, Ashoka realized that he wanted to rejuvenate the religion. If he wanted to give, him, give it that shot in the arm, which it so badly needed, it needed monuments. It needed uh, things that people could see and connect with. So that's when he sat and wondered what he should do. And in a flash, he remembered those eight baskets, which were buried, which contained Buddha's relics. So it was a very, you know, it was a very inspired moment for him when he could retrieve those caskets. He divided the contents of the caskets into 84,000 smaller caskets. And then he buried those smaller caskets all across uh, India and in other countries also. They too placed in small caskets again. And these 84,000 caskets were spread all across India and South and Southeast Asia. One of those caskets was placed in the stupa in Sanchi. So the same one that our Englishman discovered. So this stupa, the Sanchi stupa, has a very special role in Ashoka's life itself. See, Ashoka's wife was named Devi. And Devi belonged to Sanchi. So there are many historians who genuinely feel that Ashoka's conversion to Buddhism happened because of Devi. And it was Devi herself who took a great interest in constructing the Sanchi Stupa and making it a very popular one among the Buddhists in those days. So she was so successful in what she did that Sanchi became a, a center of Buddhism and a trade center. So pilgrims and traders came from far and near and they all came to Sanchi to view it. So Ashoka finally, when he died in 232 BCE, the Sanchi Stupa didn't have another patron. So gradually over time, it got destroyed, but then it also got reconstructed in later years. Subsequent dynasties took it upon themselves to reconstruct the uh, Sanchi Stupa. Now in the next thousand years after Ashoka's death, the religious landscape in India changed completely. Buddhism declined. The stupas, naturally, they all fell into ruin. So the last uh, stupa in the Sanchi complex was built somewhere around the 9th century. Now, by the 13th century, the complex itself vanished. It was completely surrounded by trees and bushes and shrubs. And the, the, building itself, the buildings themselves got lost to sight. So it now brings us to this very important question. Now, where are all those stone caskets that we spoke about? Remember, Ashoka took those original eight, he redistributed it into 84,000, and he spread it all across the world as he knew it at that time. So many of those caskets are not only in India, they're also across other countries. So today, much of South and Southeast Asia house those claim to house relics of the Buddha. All these places are important pilgrimage sites for the Buddhists. And Buddhism continues to thrive in all these places that we are speaking about now. But just imagine, none of this would have happened if not for this one king who had this tremendous vision to see how things would go in the future. And of course, in the resilience of those very chipped stone caskets, maybe that's why he chose to do it in stone. And they have represented Buddha for almost 2,500 years now. So historians generally believe that it was Ashoka who commissioned the Sanchi Stupa. It was he who built its oldest parts. But then, like I told you, after Ashoka, Buddhism declined. The stupas themselves started disintegrating. And the one in Sanji was rebuilt by many later kings and later uh, dynasties. So which were the dynasties which rebuilt the Sanji stupa? You have one called the Shungas, and you have our old friend, the Satavahanas. These two rebuilt the Sanchi Stupa also. If you remember, we told you, even the Amaravati Stupa was built by the Satavahanas. Now, did you know that these Satavahana kings were actually Hindu kings? So why did they go around building Buddhist monuments? There is an answer to that, and Lakshmi will tell you that. Thank you, Akila. 
The Satavanas were Hindu kings and they ruled between 230 BCE and 220 CE, but they were tolerant of other religions, including Buddhism. You see, Buddhism was spreading fast in South India. The Satavanas controlled a vast territory, as you can see on the map there, in central India. This central location gave them um, a great position. They served as a bridge between North and South India. So this meant that religion and culture traveled back and forth across Satavahana lands. The Satavahanas also allowed the construction of Buddhist monuments all along the important trade routes. So by the end of the Satavahana reign, there was a trail of Buddhist art all over their territory. The ornate gateways of the Sanchi Stupa, let me show you a picture. They were all built by the Satavahanas. Take a look at this picture. Recognize this monument? This is the Ajanta Caves. And uh, this is also a Buddhist monument and they were built by different kings. But did you know that the first sect of Ajanta Caves were built during the time of the Satavahanas? They were a set of 30 caves built at the Ajanta between second century BCE and fifth century CE. Now these caves, what were they really used for? Well, some of them were Buddhist prayer halls. Let me show you a picture. And they were called Chaityas. And some of them were Viharas. They were like Buddhist monasteries with hostels attached. But all of them had amazing sculptures and beautifully brightly colored paintings. Now these paintings and sculptures, they spoke of an ancient time of gods and their people, of religion and their customs. But let me ask you a question. What were these beautiful paintings and sculptures doing in the middle of a dense jungle? Well, 2000 years ago, there was no jungle. This was bang in the middle of an important trade route that connected the West Coast and the Gangetic Plains. In fact, even today, the Delhi-Bombay railway line, it runs very close to the Ajanta. The Satavanas, they had complete control over this large piece of fertile land right here in central India. The kingdom was very strategically located. Let me show you the map again, maybe. The kingdom was very strategically located and it stretched from coast to coast. So on one side, they traded with Rome, Arabia, and Egypt. And on the other, they traded with China and the Far East. Their kingdom was right in the middle of the Indian subcontinent. And anyone going from North to South India had to pass necessarily through Satavahana territory. Easy commercial towns all sprang up along the trade route and the Satavahanas, they earned huge revenues through taxes. Now, back then, it was the custom in, in, in Buddhism to build shelters along the important trade routes. Now these shelters, they served as monasteries and inns for the Buddhist pilgrims and the merchants. So these uh, Ajanta caves were part of that tradition. The Ajanta caves, the, they are quite remarkable to look at. They evolved during the Satavahana times. And later, when their successors, the Vakatakas, let me show you um, a map which shows the Vakataka reign. When the Vakatakas came into power in the third century BCE, they continued the construction and they added 24 more caves. Now the Satavanas and the Vakatakas, they had very strong armies and that gave the country, that gave that piece of land great internal stability and the bustling trade brought in great prosperity. So the country was safe and rich, and this made it a very comfortable environment for art to thrive in. Which brings us to the question, what is so great about the Ajanta Caves? Well, look at that cliff, look at the sheer cliff. It must have been really impossible for the artists to actually climb down the cliff and actually carve out the caves. So they must have hooked themselves onto ropes and they must have descended about 100 feet along the sheer cliff side. Inside the cave, 
the paintings were all filled with natural colors. Now, natural colors, they are very sensitive to moisture and sunlight. So these amazing artists, they used reflected sunlight from cloth screens and from water pools to carve and produce these paintings in semi-darkness. This work demanded great skill, great patience, and it was a testament to the power of the Satavana kings. But did the Satavana stop with just the Ajanta caves and um, other stupas? Not at all. They went on to build many more stupas apart from the Sanchi stupa, and the Amaravati stupa was one among them. Have a look at this gorgeous looking Amaravati sculpture from the Egmore Museum. In 640 CE, when the Chinese traveler Zhuang Zhang visited um, Amaravati, he marveled at its beauty and he wrote about it, he spoke about it. It is this style of sculpting, which was mastered by the Satavanas, it came to be known as the Amaravati style. And later, the Amravati style was to be a great influence on uh, Hindu art in the Chola and the Pallava period. You can find the largest collections of the Amravati priceless sculptures at the Egmore Museum in Chennai. Great. But the funny thing is, if you walk around the Egmore Gallery in the Madras Museum, I'm sorry, I'm the Amravati Gallery in the Egmore Museum. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. You won't find too many statues of Buddha over there at all. So it is the oldest collection of Buddhist art in the whole wide world. And yet there are no statues of the Buddha. I'm sure many of you all have been thinking about this question and I'm sure some answers have been hitting your brains also. But let me tell you why it happened that way. You see, in those days, in the earliest phases of Buddhism, at that time when the Satavahanas were ruling, basically, it was not considered right to depict Buddha in a human form. So that was considered not done. Because you see, the Buddha himself never called himself God. So all his teachings were not focused on a God either. No, his only focus was on leading a very virtuous life. That was what he considered the ultimate, which would give a, a, a follower what is what he called Nirvana. So Buddha himself never called himself God. So naturally, his images were never carved anywhere. So they were forbidden. His uh, followers were forbidden from worshipping his image. So for centuries after his death also, nobody created an image of Buddha. There were no paintings, there were no statues, there were no pictures of the Buddha. Instead, they used symbolism. Like you can see on your screen, you can see Buddha's footprints, his begging bowl. That's his begging bowl, which you can see all of them holding up into the and raising it to the heavens. So the begging bowl itself was considered to be Buddha. It is Buddha's begging bowl, and that itself was considered Buddha. So all the gods are lifting it towards the heavens, meaning that Buddha has attained Nirvana. So it tells the story of how Buddha ascended to the heavens. A little later, other symbolism also came in. You all have all seen the lotus, which is a very common symbolism across the Indian subcontinent, even today. And for the Buddhist, it conveyed a very beautiful idea because it said that just like this beautiful flower arises out of the slush and the mud that it grows in, one should rise out of all earthly desires and, um, uh, you know, earth, uh, very, very earthy things that we are caught in and we should come out of it and attain a better self. So the, uh, the lotus is a very common symbol, which is across the country even today. You also have this wheel with eight spokes. So we, we've used this as an example over here. But for the Buddhists, the wheel with eight spokes, it represented the eightfold path of Buddhism. So all these were the symbols that spoke of Buddha for many years to come. Only after that did they start making statues of Buddha. Which immediately brings us to the question, when were the first statues of Buddha made? So we have a clue to this from this very small statue that you can still see sitting amongst the Buddhist relics in the Egmore Museum. It is a statue of Hercules. So it makes us wonder, isn't it? What was a Greek hero, a warrior hero sitting and doing among Buddhist relics? So to answer this question, we're again going to take you back in time 
further back in time, actually, to about 100 years before Ashoka. And Lakshmi is going to tell you that story. Thank you, Akila. Uh, in 326 BCE, India faced a powerful foreign invasion, the army of the Greek king, Alexander the Great. Now, Alexander himself, he did not stay for a long time in India. It was a very short time he spent at the Indian subcontinent, but he left behind a large number of his senior nobles. It is their descendants who founded the Indo-Greek dynasties that ruled for over two centuries. Have a look at the most prominent among them all. It was the Kushans. They ruled over an area called, then called Gandhara, and it is today present day Kandahar in Afghanistan. It was at this region, Gandhara, that the Gandhara school of art developed in the second century BCE. You see, the Kushans, they were patrons of Buddhism. And uh, there, this school of art, it depicted Buddhist themes in styles that were greatly influenced by Greek sensibilities. And it was the Gandhara artists who brought about the earliest statues of Buddha. In fact, at its peak between the third and the sixth centuries BCE, much of Northern India was ruled by the Gupta empire. The Guptas, they were also Hindu kings, but they were great patrons of Buddhism. Now we've been talking so much about uh, the Amaravati sculptures. We've spoken about the origin and the discovery of the Amaravati sculptures. But apart from the Buddhist symbols that they show, what else do they depict? What do you think? Let's explore that uh, part. You see, if you look at uh, many of these sculptures, it's almost like a narrative. It's like a storybook carved in stone. And uh, that's what these uh, sculptures were. They spoke about Buddha. They spoke about stories of Buddha's life and Buddhist architecture. They are collectively called the Jataka tales. Now the Jataka tales, they were uh, a popular part of Buddhist literature. Uh, and they were a bunch, a series of actually moral stories involving the Buddha. It is said that the Buddha himself narrated these stories. The Jataka tales, they were all about Buddha's incarnations. Sometimes he would take the form of, uh, say, an animal. Sometimes it was a form of a bird or of a human. In all the previous incarnations, he is called Bodhisattva. At the Amaravati Gallery in Ekmore, you have a Bodhisattva of a particular incarnation of Buddha, and that is called Vesantara. Let me tell you the story of Vesantara Jataka. You see, Vesantara was the king of a kingdom called Sivi. And uh, on the day of his birth, a white elephant calf was brought to the palace. Now, this magical elephant, wherever it went, it brought rainfall. This meant that the land prospered and there was so much happiness and prosperity at Sivi. Now, Vesantara, he grew up to be a very, very generous prince. It is said that he would give away anything what anybody asked for. So I believe the neighboring kingdom of Kalinga, they asked him, they actually begged him for this magical elephant. You see, they also wanted to have bountiful lands and a prosperous kingdom. Without any hesitation, Vesantara handed over the elephant to Kalinga. There on the rightmost corner of the sculptor, can you see that elephant trunk? That shows that part of the story. Now, this didn't go down well with the people of Sivi at all. They didn't like this act of Vesantara. They felt that he was a very thoughtless and a leader who did not care for them. So they demanded that he be immediately banished from the land. Uh, right in the center of the sculpture, this middle panel, it shows the people asking for Vesantara to leave the land. Now Vesantara, he immediately left the kingdom with his wife and his two children in a grand chariot drawn by four horses. And along the way, he gave away that chariot to, along with its horses. You can see that scene on the left panel of the sculpture. 
And then later, Besantara and his wife, they carried the two children to a hut in the forest. You can see that on the leftmost corner of the sculpture. Now life went on until one day, a sly old man called Jujaka, he came to the forest. Now he knew of Besantara's inability to refuse a request. Now his young and pretty wife had asked for some slaves. So Jujuka went up to Vesantara and brazenly asked him for his children. Vesantara was shocked, but he gave his children away. Now this site was watched by the gods from the heavens and they were very impressed with Vesantara. They decided to get into the act and help Vesantara. So when Jujuka was leading the two children away, the gods made sure that he took the wrong lane, the lane that led right up right back to the kingdom of Sivi. Now the old king who was there at Sivi, well, he immediately recognized his grandchildren and he gave a huge fortune to Jujuka. The ecstatic Jujuka, well, he celebrated with a grand feast, but he ate too much, too fast, and then he collapsed on his plate, dead. Then the king, he called back Vesintara and his wife from the forest. And meanwhile, the white magical elephant, that too was returned by the grateful people of Kalinga. And the gods before they left, they made sure that they gave Vesintara a special boon. They said that he would never run out of funds for charity. This uh, story, this uh, story of Vesintara is part of local folklore all across Southeast Asia. And in Thailand and Cambodia, it is even celebrated as a grand festival. There are more such stories uh, in the sculptures at Amravati Gallery. Shall we look at one more with Akila? Sure, let's go on. There's one more of the Desantara. Yes, and this is one of the very famous panels from the Amravati collection, and it's called Maya's Dream. And essentially, this panel tells the story of Buddha's birth itself. You see, a long time ago, in the 6th century BCE, there was a king named King Sudodana, and his wife was Queen Maya. They were supposed to have lived in modern-day Nepal, and they ruled over a tribe which was called the Sakyas. So this royal couple were very good with everything else, but the one problem was that they were childless. And that weighed very heavily on their minds. But one night, Maya had a dream, a very strange dream, because she dreamt that a white elephant entered her womb. So the wise men in the palace, they all interpreted the dream for her. And they said that this meant that Maya would soon be blessed with a baby boy, a son. And they also had one more prophecy to make. They said this little boy would grow up to either be a great king or a great monk. So there was a choice over there. So you can see this on the panel of the, uh, on, on, the, on the pictures, isn't it? You can see Maya lying there on her bed, surrounded by all her attendants. And there on the other half, on the right half of the panel, you can see this man holding up his hand, showing the two possibilities that could happen. Well, it worked because it did come true. Maya did deliver a little boy. He was born, he was named, Siddhartha. The king, he wanted to make sure that Siddhartha would become a great king. Like any other king, he wanted his son to follow in his footsteps. He didn't want him to become a monk by any chance. So he raised him in a very protected manner, in a very sheltered manner. He never even let him go out of the palace. He was not exposed to any suffering, to any difficulties in life. But fate will have its way, right? When Siddhartha was 29 years old, one night he went out for a drive in his chariot and he saw all those sights which saddened him very, very deeply. He saw all the suffering in the world. He came back to the palace, a very disturbed man, and that very night he fled from the palace. He ran away, he traveled all around the world, he searched for years for a solution to all these problems, to, for, to human suffering itself. And one fine day, when he meditated under a peepal tree in a place called Bodh Gaya in Bihar, he found the answers that he was searching for so desperately. So 
So from that day, Siddhartha became the Buddha, meaning the enlightened one. So the story, it, it is said that for 45 years after that, Buddha is said to have walked over much of North India, talking to people, meeting with people, discussing his philosophy with all of them. And this idea went on to some people who accepted what he had to say. And this was kept alive by small groups of monks across the northern part of India. Now, things changed pretty dramatically in the third century when Emperor Ashoka came into the picture. He converted to Buddhism. He also believed in actively promoting this religion, which answered so many questions inside him. Not just him, his son and his daughter were also pulled into this. So it is believed that Ashoka's son and daughter, Mahinda and Sangamitra, they are said to have traveled all the way to Sri Lanka and to have uh, planted Buddhism over there, planted the seeds of Buddhism in Sri Lanka. So Buddhism took root in Sri Lanka and from there it traveled all across Southeast Asia, Burma, Nepal, China, Japan, Tibet. It went to all these countries. In India too, Buddhism grew at a very fast pace in the first few years, first few centuries after its birth. Right until the sixth century BC, it was growing very quickly. But from the sixth century BC onwards, there was a Hindu revival movement called the Bhakti movement. And that movement gently nudged, nudged Buddhism out of India. So strangely today in India, which was the land of its birth, there are very few practicing Buddhists. But all over the world, there are about 50,000, 50 million, 500 million people, I'm sorry, there are about 500 million people who follow Buddhism. So it's a religion which has traveled far and wide and which went right out of its country of birth. So we really hope you've enjoyed all these stories that we had to share with you today. There are, of course, many other stories behind Indian monuments. But before we go there, Lakshmi, do you think we should look for some questions that we can answer? Uh, before we go to the questions, Akila, we have a request uh, for you to share the Rama Grama Stupa story. Uh, we have a bit of time left. And um, shall I show you the picture? And oh, please, yes. Please share that. Yes, please do. So this is the Ramagrama Stupa. And as stupas go, this is more famous than the rest of them. And there is a reason why it is more famous. Now, if you remember, I was telling you about how Ashoka picked up those um, original caskets, the stone caskets from which were scattered over eight places and redistributed them into 84,000 stone caskets, which he buried all around the known world at that time. But he didn't really lay his hands on all eight of those caskets. One escaped him, and that is the Ramagrama Stupa. The story says that when Ashoka went to Ramagrama Stupa, which is today in Nepal, to try and get those remains out, the people of that land, those who were ruling, they were called the Nagas. They put up a very spirited uh, resistance to Ashoka's uh, quest of removing the stupa from there. So Ashoka, try as he might, could not get his hands on them. So that is still one stupa, which has the original caskets. The one eighth of Buddha's remains are still over there. So it's completely buried under the ground, as you can see, and it's just a mound. You can't see a stupa. I told you that a stupa had a dome shaped, uh, uh, it, it is a dome shaped structure, isn't it? You can't see any such a thing like that. It's just a mound in the ground but it is considered an extremely holy place for the um, Buddhists even today. And many people go there as pilgrims to see Ramadrama Stupa. Thank you. Thank you, Akila. Uh, we have another um, request to share a little bit of uh, information and story about the Brahmi script. Uh, something about it, about the squiggles and how it came about. Uh, maybe if you could share a few words, then we could go in for the questions. Let me just show you the Brahmi script uh, here, and you could take it from there. It comes as part of the Ashoka story, there you have and it, yes. uh, it's got an interesting okay. connection with even uh, Princep and how it came about. So I thought you could share a bit. Yes. So this is the Brahmi script, and many Englishmen who had come here had been seeing this in various places. Now, uh, one story is about how Ashoka himself uh, carved a lot of detail about what he thought was right, what he felt life was should be lived as. 
and what were his instructions to his subjects, what his ideas were on uh, governance and uh, administration. So all this he carved out on rock faces, on rock pillars, on, um, pillar, uh, on columns. And he had it scattered all over his kingdom, which was a large one. So in those days, there was a script and the script was the Brahmi script. That's what they used to write. The Brahmi script was used in all of Ashoka's uh, pillars. But as time went on, this script fell into disuse. Other newer scripts, easier scripts came into being and those started being used by the people. So as time went on, people forgot all about Ashoka's script. Now this was in the third century BCE. Right until the 13th century B, uh, CE, people had no clue what the Brahmi script was all about. In the 13th century BC, uh, in the 13th century CE, there was a Mughal, uh, there was a king in Delhi who decided to go on a hunt, and he stumbled across a couple of tall pillars which bore a lot of inscriptions on them. He didn't know what exactly those pillars said, but they looked good. So he carried it all the way back to Firoshak, uh, his, uh, his capital, Firosha Kokla. It was Firosha Tuklak who was on this hunt, really. He carried it back to his new capital. He was building Firosha Kokla at that time. So he fixed it on top of his citadel. Hmm. It made for a nice, uh, uh, an attractive uh, piece <laughs> that people could look at over there. So he fixed it over there. People saw that it was there was lots of uh, there were lots of squiggles all over it, like Lakshmi rightly said, but nobody knew what those squiggles meant. So that was the 13th century. In the 18th century, the British came there, and when one Englishman named James Prinsep took a look at it, he too was surprised. I'm sure he asked all the Indians around, "What does it say?" And I'm sure all the Indians said, "We have no clue because we don't use that script anymore." Well, Prinsep made it his life's work to break that script. So he spent time trying to decipher what was written over there. Finally, he got hold of one word, you know, the word is Danam. So he found it repeated in many places and using that one word as a key, gradually and very patiently, he deciphered the entire script. And that's when everybody knew the story of Ashoka, knew the story of Ashokan edicts, and so many other things fell into place, including the Sri Lankan connection. Because it was, he used to be called Piyadasi, Devanam Piya, Piyadasi in Sri Lanka. So how did an Ashoka who ruled in the northernmost part of India end up, uh, uh, have his name featured in Sri Lanka? Simply because he took the religion there. He took Buddhism there. So you see, a lot of gaps got filled up when all these things were happened, uh, when all these things uh, uh, came to uh, the historian's uh, understanding. And today, there are many historians who can read from me, like, uh, like we read English or our own local languages, but it was a big way to break open a big chunk of Indian history at that time. Great. Um, thank you, Akila. And uh, before we go to the questions, uh, maybe um, you could conclude the workshop and then we can go on to the questions. Yes. <laughs> so it's been a pleasure having all of you all with us on this uh, workshop. We do hope you've enjoyed the stories. What we've told you is just a few of the stories of Indian monuments, just waiting to be told, actually. These are stories which are so much there and which are so interesting because I hope you were able to catch all those links which happened from one story to the other. So we've used these links to tell you the story of the evolution of Buddhism and we've managed to associate so many monuments with this story. So like we said, if you have some questions, we will take them now. And if you did like these stories and you'd like to listen to some more or read a little bit more about these, please do log into our website, www.storytrails.in, and you'll be able to find answers to many of them. We hope. Um, we have some nice questions here, Akila. Um, why did Buddhism go away from the land of its birth? Oh, yes. It is a very disturbing question, isn't it? It was born <laughs> here and yet it went straight out of here. Why? Because, see, the general confusion that happens is Buddhism and Jainism kind of took center stage in the 6th century BCE. But was there, did they both originate at the same time? Not really. You see, Buddhism originated then, but Mahavira, who was a contemporary of Buddha, was actually the 24th Tirthankara. So it was already quite an established religion before that, before the uh, 6th century. 
whereas buddhism had to start from the 6th century and slowly entrench itself into this country get people to join in and to follow to to convince people that this was a good philosophy to follow there were people who were doing that it took a long time and uh, there were only a few kingdoms which you know accepted buddhism as its national religion unlike uh, many kings who accepted uh, uh, hinduism as their uh, state religion you have the palas and the senas in bengal who did it you have the uh, indo greeks who did it a longer time ago but in south india for instance there were just some isolated kings who followed buddhism but it had spread right down until south india and it lasted until the 6th century until the 6th century it was quite aggressive in its uh, attempt to you know get itself a strong following in this country but by the 6th century the bhakti movement had started and the bhakti movement was a very uh, active movement it was it was a resurgence that's how it's uh, that's what that's how historians call it so it was so um, it was so energetic in its in the way it uh, started out that it uh, you know just took everyone back into its fold and so this religion which started in india really found that it was kind of swept out of this country and into other countries uh but for most but for many many buddhists most of the holiest places in india are still in uh, many of the holiest places in buddhism are still in india so as uh, tourism they come here a lot as pilgrim Do you see any of the other questions that you, that you might like to answer? Do you see it? Where um, are the Gandhara panels at present? The Gandhara panels, the ones that we showed you in the picture, some of them are with the Madras Museum, the Egyptian yes. Museum. Yeah. But the Gandhara art is kind of spread out over much of India. Most of the Buddhist uh, ancient works that you see would still follow the Gandhara style of carving. Uh, it's very distinctive in a couple of ways. You can instantly identify it. all the curly hairs that Buddha has. No, those curls that you can see on Buddha's head, the drapery of his clothing. You can see the folds of his clothing. Those are typical Gandhara art. So most of the statues, the ancient sculptures of Buddha that you can see around India today will follow the Gandhara style. Um, there is um, sorry. There is another question that's. Uh... come uh, which is older jainism or buddhism uh, that's what no we were saying buddha was the first great guru of buddhism whereas mahavira who was buddha's contemporary who was also in the 6th century bc he was the 24th tirthankara that means there were 23 ahead of him which means jainism is older than buddhism There is a question. Is there any story about Sankisa Stupa in UP? Yeah. I'm sorry, yeah. uh, Madhu. I'm uh, really afraid. I don't know anything yeah. about the Sankisa Stupa. Probably we'll find out a bit. Yeah, we'll yes. find out and see. Uh, there's another question that has come in. Um, where else do you find uh, stupas of uh, Buddha in India? Other there places? There are plenty. Patna has one. Um, there, there are quite a few. There are many yes. across. Uh, yes, uh, Bodh Gaya has. um lots of places in the eastern part of the country do have stupas and um another one was uh, apart from the satavahanas uh, were there other dynasties that encouraged buddhism i was just talking about that no entire dynasties encouraging buddhism there were very few the oh. indo greeks did it the, the sakas the parthians they were buddhist and then you had the palas and the senas of bengal they too were buddhist kings hmm. but other than that finding entire buddhist dynasties was a little um, it wasn't a very common place thing down in the south there were many kings within some dynasties like the pallavas or the pandyas who took to buddhism for a short time or took to jainism for a short time and then reconverted back to hinduism or went back to whatever religion they initially followed so it didn't have too much uh, support from kingdoms as a state religion like other religions had and maybe that was also one of the reasons why it could not sustain itself in india thank you atla um motoshi ma'am over to you thank you thank you akila ma'am and lakshmi ma'am that was such a beautiful journey we were, we just gone through so much to know i mean it's so beautiful and 
so rich history and it's really the research and the story the way you narrated it's really beautiful and i think all the questions and answers were covered by both of you i don't think any doubts are there i could see uh, mr jadav he raised a hand and i thought of uh, unmute him but i think he somehow he couldn't connect and he couldn't put his questions anyways oh. i think rest of the questions and everything and all the stories were so clearly presented that i don't think any doubt is left out <laughs> okay Thank so you. time to and um, do you want to say something while ending it do you love the floor is yours uh, okay so with that i would like to then end the session thank you very much ma'am thank you story tales for being with us and coming uh, time to time with such beautiful stories and such beautiful speakers especially the presentation is so well i was like hooked to it <laughs> thank you thank you thank you on behalf of ministry of tourism we would like to thank you and we we will do more many more such sessions with such unique unknown uh, topics in the coming days thank you for all support and thank you feroz ji nagd team for always being with us and thank you our social media team so again it's a weekend please go ahead enjoy your holiday and be safe take care see you then next week namaskar thank you everybody we had a wonderful time hosting all of you and uh, we look forward to doing more webinars with the ministry of tourism thank you so much